Hello YouTube, my name is Patrick Cook and this is my final project for my pattern recognition class. The name of my project is Gender Prediction from Handwriting Using Pattern Recognition. My project is based on the ICDAR 2013 contest that was hosted by the 12th International Conference on Document Analysis and Recognition. The objective of this, co this contest was to create a predictive model that predicts the gender of a writer based on his handwriting. A prize was offered of $1,000, and if you won, you also got a free conference publication at the conference. Over Almost 200 teams signed up for this contest, and I was hoping to be one of those teams. However, the contest ended before I could finish my project. So instead, I used the contest as an opportunity to do a learning experiment to try to test different predictive models. I was able to do this because the leaderboards for this contest were left open after the contest ended so you could see how you would have measured up if you were a part of the contest. Now the data set for this contest was derived from the Qatar University Writer Identification Data Set. This is a bilingual handwritten document data set where the two languages in the data set are English and Arabic. 475 writers worth of data were pulled from this data set and this set of writers was divided up into a training set with size 282 and a test set of size 193. Now each writer contributed four different handwriting samples, two of which are in English and two of which are in Arabic. We're going to, I'm going to show you a few of the writing samples to give you a little illustration of what I'm talking about. Now this database was created to do both writer dependent and writer independent or excuse me, text dependent and text independent writer identification. What this means is for text independent writer identification basically it doesn't matter what the writer wrote any words can be used so in order to you know test or approximate this the one of the handwriting examples in each language is just six random lines that are chosen by the person who wrote it for text dependent writer identification the writing samples use to represent this were just a three paragraph passage that every single volunteer who contributed to this data set had to copy. It's the same for every single person who contributed to the data set. And this was done in both Arabic and English as you can see here from these samples I'm showing you right now. <coughs> now that I've talked about the data set, I want to talk about the approach I took for testing each one or training and testing each one of my models. This is a four step process that um, uh, includes pre-processing data, selecting features, training the prediction models, and then doing some post-processing, which in this case was just clamping in invalid predictions. I actually took two different approaches to this problem. The first one assumes that language does not matter and that the same features in English writing correspond to the same features in Arabic writing so that they both contribute the same amount to gender, not different features in each language you know, decide gender. <clears throat> this is what I consider my base approach. Um, during the pre-processing stage I removed useless features that didn't really contribute anything. This, I consider a feature useless if it has near zero variance because some of the predictive models that I use are very susceptible to near zero variance and if there are some near zero variance features in the data set <coughs> then it might, the model might fit. Now while that did cut down on the feature set size quite a bit it wasn't enough to actually have computationally feasible models that I could do in the time frame for this project. So on top of that I ran a uh, framework called the Minimal Redundancy Maximal Relevance Framework, which basically tries to maximize the amount of unique information in a feature set. <coughs> By selecting features in this way, um, I'm not biasing the feature set towards any specific predictive model. It's a very model independent uh, selection feature algorithm. Um, I wanted to work with a feature set size of like a maximum of, of 100, so I actually chose a few feature set sizes ranging from 11 features to 100 features to test 
these uh, training and test and train the prediction predictive models I created. Now for the actual training of the prediction models, um, this was done using a grid search where basically I created a bunch of different versions of each model where I was tweaking each of the uh, optimal parameters for them and then I was doing cross validation which is basically a technique using resampling to basically uh, get the most out of a data set for using it for both for training and for validation. And then at the end, if any of my uh, models threw uh, invalid predictions, I would clamp those to the maximum or minimum possible value they can be. Because what the, the uh, final output of my predictor is supposed to be a, the probability of whether or not the right, a specific writer is male. Now, the language-dependent approach actually ends up class making two classifiers and averaging their results into one final uh, uh, pr prediction. Uh, the two classifiers or pred predictive models are trained on mutually exclusive data sets. In this case, it was by language. You, I separated it into an English uh, data set and an Arabic data set, and I selected a unique set of features for each data set instead of using the same features for both data sets. <laughs> I trained two predictive models. Um, also, back for selection features, I used the same uh, minimal redundancy, maximal relevance algorithm. And as I said before, uh, in order to end up with a single prediction for each writer, I averaged the outputs of both the English prediction model on the Arabic predictive model. And again, if there are any valid predictions, I would clamp them to their minimum or maximum value. Anyway, I did my uh, project. First one is, uh, I'm just going to name them off and then go over the, well, name the parameters because I don't really have time to get into them. But I evaluated a neural network and the three uh, adjustable parameters I played with was the weight decay for each all the weights in the neural network, the amount of nodes in the hidden layer of a neural network, and then whether or not bagging is applied to the neural network. For support vector machines, there were two different parameters to play with, the choice of the kernel function, as well as a basically a margin error trade-off. How much error will you, will, you to, will you tolerate for a certain dividing hyperplane in the support vector machine. Some of the kernels actually have their own parameters to play with. The radial basis function has a parameter sigma and the polynomial one has the order as well as some other ones but for sake of time I'm going to skip on those ones. The two evaluated models that don't have parameters to play with are logistic regression and robust regression the mixture discriminant analysis or the aka the Gaussian mixture models has the number of Gaussian distributions to tweak and then in random forests basically the branching factor of the tree how many variables you pick to split on at each node is what you can play with and then in the gradient boosting machines the number of trees your learning rate and then how the variables interact in the tree are the parameters you can play with when you're doing your uh, optimization. Now after I did the whole process of pre-processing, feature selection, uh, actual training, and then post-processing, I ended up submitting the best version of all the models I trained to the leaderboard to see how they did. And for the most part, they stuck pretty close together. Um, if I had used uh, any one of the kernels, I would have been somewhere in the hundreds, so like the median in the middle. But there was one model that stood out above the rest, and this was the gradient boosting machine. It, If I had used it and I actually took the leaderboard, I would have been 43, which I thought was pretty good. Now. To be honest, this result didn't uh, surprise me because the winner of the contest actually used a version of gradient boosting machines called gradient bo boosting decision trees. So basically, my analysis uh, confirms his approach to winning the contest. 
uh, I'm, now I'm going to go into some related work that were, was basically the uh, motivation for this contest, where the uh, idea for the contest came from. Uh, two uh, papers that have gone into a similar subject about how you can predict gender or other demographics from handwriting using a handwritten document database. Each of these papers uses a different database. Um, in the Bandi and Srihari Sur Sur paper, excuse me, they used a Cedar letter data database where the training set was about 800 and the test set was about 400. Uh, they used 11 features for their um, analysis and they only used neural networks, but they um, used two ensemble methods to combine them, they used bagged and boosted. The best model in their paper was a boosted neural network that actually achieved 77.5% accuracy. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to, re to report accuracy numbers in my report because the answers to the test set were not yet released to me. So the only metric I could give was the log loss metric that they used to judge each person, and that's how you got your ranking was on it, the ranking was on this log loss function that they defined. <coughs> now the other paper, the Lewicki paper, um, they also use the database. The special thing about this paper was they actually use online information, which means they use temporal information. They actually used a whiteboard that records writing feature data to get their uh, test set and their features in a training set. And in this paper, they evaluated support vector machines, four different kernels actually, and the Gaussian mixture models. And what they found is that the Gaussian mixture models performed best with 67.06% um, accuracy. Now granted, compared to the other paper, this might seem kind of bad, but they were testing on a much smaller set. so it, it can make sense. I, I can't say for certain to see how much the how worse or better these two parts are, and that's pretty much the uh, shortcomings of these works is they don't really compare to outside works. Now, for the actual implementation of my project, it was all done using the programming language R, which is a statistical computing language and environment. It's open source. So if you don't like paying for MATLAB or anything of that stuff, it's a great tool to use. I actually had a lot of fun learning it in the past couple of weeks. Now in order to run the code I use, uh, three packages are required, which are also free to get. I use the caret package, which is stands for classification and regression training. There's also the minimal redundancy, maximal relevance package I use, which in this case is called M, the MRMRE where the E stands for ensemble because you can actually do repeated MRMR stuff. And then there's also another optional one called the do parallel package which allows you to use you know the multiple cores in your computer. Uh, that's the end of my slideshow. I'm going to go through my code real quick so you can see what it exactly entails. It's pretty simple. Basically, uh, what you do is you, you would boot it up if you had my code. It's a really simple script. I'll actually show it to you guys here. I'll pull it up real quick. You've got a main function that does <coughs> your data extraction from the files you were given. Um, you go through and do some pre-processing. And this the major loop here, this is where all the work is done, pretty much. You do the, fi the final pre-processing where you remove irrelevant features. You do your feature selection here. And then you do your training. In total, I trained about, I think it was 96 models, because I did the four feature set sizes. I had eight different models I evaluated. <coughs> And then I did three different models, one for the total data set, and then one for the English data set, and one for the Arabic data set. 